So what you see before you is the Moon Trek uh, opening window. And you see the first thing it'll ask you is if you want to go through a tutorial that will essentially explain all the various controls here in the interface. Um, that's a good thing to do. Today we're going to skip that because I shall be your tutorial. But in the future, uh, know that that is there as a help to you. So what we see here is an equirectangular projection of the surface of the moon. We essentially have a GIS system for the moon. And like any good GIS system, we can zoom, we can pan. So what I'll do right now is we'll zoom in to the crater Tycho. And I'm going to make one adjustment right away. I'm going to turn off a certain feature. We'll get back to that in a little bit. But uh, you can see here that we are able to zoom in and pan. And here's a, you know, still a fairly wide angle view of Tycho. But uh, when you are studying a feature, one of the things that you might want to know is how big is it. And that is very simple to determine using Moon Trek. It's as simple as drawing a line. So in the upper right, there's a tool button. I click that. And I click the Calculate Distance option. And it, it's going to be as simple as drawing a line. We'll just draw a line across the crater Tycho here. And uh, we see it's a little over 85 kilometers across. Good sized hole in the ground. And uh, the next thing you might want to know is how deep it is. So we'll go back up to the menu here in the upper right. And we can do an elevation profile. And uh, Again, we'll draw a line. This time we'll extend it on either side so that we catch the rim. And it's going to think for just a moment. And here we see we have an elevation profile. So you can measure uh, the heights of mountains, the depths of valleys and craters very easily. Is that all showing up for you? That is marvelous. Yeah, I do a lot of sidewalk and people always ask me, what are those mountains in the middle of the craters? How big are they and stuff? And this is super cool. Yeah, so this way you'll be able to, to answer those questions fairly easily. Now, another thing you can do is you can draw a bounding box around any feature. And uh, when you, do this, we see we're able to actually generate a 3D print file, either STL or OBJ. So if you've got a, a 3D printer, you can go ahead and generate 3D print files for any terrain that you like. Uh, I'll tell you, those disappear off my desk really quickly. Um, another fun, real fun feature is this experience trek vr and with that what you do is you draw a path anywhere you want across the surface and it will return to you a qr code scan this qr code into your smartphone either ios or android then put your smartphone in a pair of cheap $5 or so Google compatible, you know, cardboard compatible goggles. And whatever path you drew, you will now fly in virtual reality. So you can create your own virtual reality flyovers of any part of the moon you want. So that's also kind of fun. Quite frankly, my favorite part, though, is um, to go down here to the lower left, and we have an option for projections. And right now, we are in this global map, again, an equal rectangular projection. 
we'll talk about the various projections. Right now I'm going to switch to the 3D globe view. And this is going to probably perform very slowly over Zoom and somewhat jerky, but uh, it will be better for you when you drive it yourself. But what we can do here is we can we can have a 3D view of the moon and we can interactively fly over its surface. Down into craters, exploring interactively. Now that, again, this is probably looking pretty jerky to you coming over Zoom, uh, but when you do it yourself, um, it's actually pretty smooth. And I'll oftentimes do screen captures of the uh, uh, flights, and these can be very, very instructive videos to use in a number of different settings. So uh, we'll get back into our global map view here. And uh, well, a couple of other tools I'll point out. Um, one is calculating sun angle. And as observers and imagers of the moon, this is uh, obviously a critical thing. So you can um, drop a marker. So here we'll drop a marker on the uh, central peak of Tycho. And you can enter a beginning date, an ending date, as well as uh, UTC time. And let's see, well, uh, yeah, that's good. And we'll submit it. And what we will end up getting is a plot of elevation and azimuth of the sun over the time interval that you specified. So um, a lot of times when you are viewing or imaging features, knowing what the lighting is going to be on that feature is a critical thing to know. And this can help you figure that out. And then a lot of fun is uh, this is particularly for um, education applications. We have this tool here. We call it the country mover, strangely enough. And what it allows you to do is take the moon and you can overlay any state in the union or any country in the world. So since we have a California crowd here, I'm going to overlay the state of California. And we can drag California to wherever we want. So for instance, if we wanted to compare the Aristarchus Plateau to California and the Bay Area, it gives you a way of essentially bringing this to the public in a way that they can kind of understand the size of the features they may be seeing through your telescope. Just telling them how many kilometers it is is not necessarily something that uh, they will relate to, but being able to do something like this is a lot of fun. So again, we'll take and put uh, Copernicus here over uh, our particular area of Northern California. You can see it's, uh, you can get an idea for how big a hole in the ground that really is. It's pretty impressive, so. That is impressive. Um, so that's a lot of fun. So um, the real power though of, the portal is, as I said before, you can 
view the surface of the moon as seen through the eyes of many different instruments aboard many different spacecraft. So um, let's do uh, an example. So what I'm going to do here is if we go down on the lower right, there's this fly to button. And you can enter a latitude and longitude if you want, or you can enter a location such as Marius. And here, it'll fly us to Marius. And of course, Marius is the home of the Marius Hills, uh, one of the more spectacular collections of volcanic peaks on the moon. But as you probably know, uh, most volcanoes on the moon are very, very, very low profile features. And they require a very, very grazing sun angle in order to be well visualized. Here, even though we're using the uh, LROC camera aboard the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, this doesn't look overwhelmingly impressive. Uh, but going up here to the upper left, we have our data menu. And clicking that will reveal that there are literally thousands of data layers from many different instruments on many different spacecraft that we can go through here. And these have been these georeferenced and co-registered so that we can just switch from one view to another. Now, again, there are thousands of layers here. So I'm going to show you just a few of my favorite. And one is um, this Lola and TC Stereo Dem Merge. So this is a digital elevation model using the Lunar Orbiter Laser Altimeter as well as the uh, terrain camera aboard uh, Kaguya. So uh, you've got a blend of data coming from two different instruments on two different spacecraft from two different nations. And here you can read data about the data. We're going to go ahead and we're going to add this. And now you see we have this altimetry view of the Marius Hills. And you can see how all these peaks and domes just suddenly pop out. Uh, they really show up very nicely. And uh, of course, one of the things that has confounded lunar scientists for a long time was the whole concept of the size of volcanoes. We have basaltic volcanism going on here on the moon. Um, but here on Earth, we have giant shield volcanoes. Uh, same thing for Mars, of course, with things like Olympus Mons. And on, you know, on Venus, too. And wherever we find basaltic volcanism, we usually find giant shield volcanoes. But as we look at the moon, we just see these little pipsqueak things. And one of the big questions was, well, where are the giant shields on the moon? Well, it turns out they're actually hiding in plain sight. And you can demonstrate that here. We'll use the elevation profile. And let's go ahead and draw a line through the volcanic field here. And what we can see is this whole complex is actually on top of a great but very subtle rise. So there's actually a large shield volcano underlying the Marius Hills. And these domes and cones essentially crown the top of the large hidden shield volcano. And there are a number of these giant shields. The reason, though, that they are so low profile is because the uh, lava that erupted on the moon, in general, had a very, very, very low viscosity because it had very low silica content. And so because it had such a low viscosity, it built very, very shallow 
mountain peaks. Now, again, I mentioned that we can look at many different views. So let's take a look at this same area, but now I'm gonna pull up a different data set. Um, so we can search here and I'm going to do uh, a free air gravity map, color coded, and we'll go ahead and add that onto our stack here. And now we have a completely different view of that same area. And in this case, blue is low gravity, red is high gravity. And as you start adding layers, you're essentially creating a stack of different views. And you can drag and drop, you can reorder the items in your stack. You can turn their visibility on and off, so you can toggle them on and off. Um, you can show detailed information, uh, essentially an abstract about that data product. You can, uh, if it's not a data, a global data product, you can zoom to its position. Uh, in this case, we have a color-coded legend that you can read, so understand what these colors uh, actually refer to in terms of gravimetric data. You can even look at the detailed metadata for the data product and you can download the data. So if you've got some other software that you want to use this data in, this is a portal for you to be able to download various data products. And you can also remove a uh, data product from your stack. But one of the neat things that you can do too is you can adjust the transparency. So here now I am blending the gravity map and the laser altimetry map. And in doing so, we are able to now visualize both the surface manifestation of the volcanic field as expressed by the laser altimetry, as well as we can at the same time visualize the now solidified uninterrupted plug of magma beneath the volcanic complex. So we're seeing the surface as well as what's going on beneath, beneath the surface at the same time. And we're doing that by, comp by combining two very disparate data products from different missions, uh, completely different views. And so this is neat. You can take different views of the moon and combine them in ways that perhaps nobody has done before but allowing you to see things that no single data product, no single view can show you. And so this is, this is kind of neat stuff. This is fun and it can be very useful. Now, blending data like this is admittedly uh, somewhat of a artistic manual process. But once you've got something that is telling a story that you think is very interesting, then it's quite possible that you might want to share that with others. And fortunately, that's very easy to do. Moontrek is all browser based. You know, you don't have to install any software. You don't buy anything. It just point preferably your Chrome browser at it. And what you have an option of doing, since this is browser-based, you can share a link. And so you'll see here that we can generate a URL that you can simply copy. And then you can paste this into an email or a Slack message or whatever you want. Send that out to your friends. They then take that URL you've generated, paste it into their browser. It'll bring up Moontrek, load the various data layers that you've loaded, pan and zoom and make the corrections and adjustments, and it will recreate your visualization. So you can share your custom visualization with anyone else. And Brian, you can do that with the, with the flyover too, right? Um, no, the flyover itself at this point, not. Now what we're okay. going to do, what we're working on is a, 
is a movie maker that will allow you to uh, essentially script a movie. So what I do now is for the flyovers, I just do essentially a video screen capture. And uh, that you may have seen, I've posted uh, one or two of those in the um, Facebook forum before. And that, that's how I do that now. But we're going to be uh, eventually adding a uh, scripted movie maker that will allow you to uh, pre-script what the flight path is and what the camera angle is. Uh, right now, the work we're doing for Artemis is kind of taking precedent over that. So um, it's a little bit on the back burner, I have to yeah. say. <laughs> well, as long as you know how to get around, that's good. Yep. So a um, couple of other features. So I'm going to go ahead and we'll go ahead and turn these views off and go back to our um, general view here. Um, we can do a few other things. We can uh, turn on a nomenclature layer. So if you want to have the names of features displayed, you can do that. Um, we also have a graticule that we can turn on so that you can see lines of longitude and latitude. Um, but I will also point out that wherever you move your cursor, if you look down in the lower, uh, lower right here, you will see the latitude and longitude of whatever you're pointing at. So if you want to record the longitude and latitude of anything, uh, it's very easy to determine what that position is. Um, our base map here that we're using is the LRO WAC Mosaic, wide angle camera. And this is really an excellent product. It covers the moon in pretty seamless uh, mosaic with high fidelity. Um, but it is a wide angle camera. And of course, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter does have also the narrow angle camera. And so there is this narrow angle camera auto layer that you can turn on. And in doing that, it will add um, various, it looks like post stamps. Let's see, I'll click on in a moment here. There we go. So we don't have the entire moon covered at this high resolution here, but we can zoom in to particular areas um, in extremely high resolution, getting down to uh, essentially, you know, meter scale resolution. That's insane. Wow. Yeah. And uh, you can, when we go to the data layer, what, um, okay. you can do searches by a variety of manners. So you can look at product types, um, so different categories, so crust, geology, gravity, hazards, imagery, landing sites, lighting, uh, mineralogy. You can um, search by various instruments and aboard different missions. So again, if you wanted to look for things specifically using that high resolution camera aboard Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, you could narrow down your searches to uh, that particular instrument. And you can also do spatial searches. You can essentially draw polygons or over any area of the moon and see what data products are available representing that. So there are different ways to search uh, for different data products. Um, something else uh, we have are these bookmarks. Uh, and we'll be adding more of those. But so for instance, 
we have this Apollo 11 bookmark and adding it will take us, let me make sure I'm in the right view here. Uh, yeah, global map view. So we'll, uh, we'll add it. And <laughs> here we are now at the Apollo 11 landing site. And we also have marked various points of interest. So we have West Crater here that uh, they, they were originally being directed down to, um, couldn't land there. So, but you can see we get a little bit of a description of West Crater. Uh, they ended up flying to Little West Crater. Uh, you can read about that. And you can look at some of the actual instruments they left behind. And I'm going to hide the markers right now. And you can see that we can zoom in. And here we can see the descent stage of the lunar module. We can see the dark lines of their footprints. We can see the uh, passive si seismic experiment and uh, the uh, retro reflector that were left behind. So, uh, yeah, it's pretty remarkable the level of detail that you can see here. It's uh, pretty neat. So, this is, uh, we'll be adding, of course, to this as we have new landing sites coming up. Um, Let's take a look at the polar projections. So you have a south polar and north polar projection. So we'll jump to the south polar projection. And uh, this is of course of great interest because of the fact that this is where we're planning to send humans. And so uh, using the narrow angle camera, we can zoom down to the rim of Shackleton Crater, and we can get down to some pretty exquisite detail here. Um, so our exact landing spot is yet to be determined for the human missions. Uh, however, when, uh, Monday, uh, NASA will be holding a uh, announcement for where the Viper rover is going to be going, uh, and that's going to be in November of 23, we're going to see the Viper rover uh, landing somewhere here on the, in the region of the lunar south pole and start prospecting for water ice. But um, one of the things, of course, you'll notice about the south pole of the moon is it is very, very heavily shadowed. Um, that's because the sunlight is coming in essentially horizontally. But you can pierce those shadows. Again, uh, we'll, uh, you can see we have lots of laser altimetry. And I'm going to go down here and look for a uh, hill shade. 75 so we'll go ahead and add that and you can see now we pierce those shadows very nicely and we can see the rugged detail of the South Polar region. Um, another thing we might want to do, is, especially as we're planning traverses, is um, look at slope maps. So uh, we've got a variety of slope maps for uh, general areas as, or for specific areas as well as slope maps for the whole South Polar region. So here's a slope map generated by the Chang'e 2 
orbiter and uh, blue is relatively level and red is someplace you probably don't want to go. We can uh, overlay things such as determine where are those areas of permanent shadow. So we have, again, there's a lot of things to look for here, but I'm going to add this overlay of permanently shadowed areas. And these are, of course, areas that we're very, very interested in because these can be areas where water ice might be sequestered. Um, we can do things such as, so if we're, again, our goal here is finding the resource of water, we can continue that by, let's look at uh, temperatures. So one of the things we know is that um, these permanently shadowed regions can be among the coldest places we've found anywhere in the solar system. And uh, here you can see we have our legend. So this is average surface temperature. We can also bring up maximum surface temperatures. Um, we can do something like, we don't have essentially anything that tells us exactly where water is, but we have a good proxy for that. And that is uh, through neutron spectrometry, we can show the presence of hydrogen. And so we can bring up uh, a map of concentrations of hydrogen. And uh, one of the most likely forms that that hydrogen is going to take is in the form of ices. Um, I'll show one more. Uh, let's clear and we'll do a search here for um, we have maps of ice stability at depth. So this is thermal modeling. How deep would you have to dig in order to get to a temperature where ice is stable? And in these permanently shadowed regions, you don't have to dig at all. That's the case right on the surface. So again, you can create a stack of layers and you can turn them on and off, rearrange them however you want. Um, but you can use this to tell very interesting stories. So um, with that, we'll go back to our global map view and Let's zoom out because we're now in an equal rectangular. The, of course, the pole gets really stretched out. But let's just look at some of the amazing things we can see here. Um, it's just really fun to go cruising around the surface of the moon. Um, we have, I'm going to, again, I'm going to turn off the knack so that we get a nice seamless view here. But, uh, we can, for instance, uh, zoom down to the Apennine Mountains. And of course, we have Hadley Rill here. We can, here's Plato coming across. We can cruise up to, um, See the Alpine Valley and out to see Sinus Aridum. And here we'll cruise over to the Grutheusen Domes and these are, of course, a fun observing target. And these are really interesting examples of lunar volcanoes that don't fit the paradigm of low slope volcanoes. These are big, towering, steep mountains. 
we can appreciate that. Let's go into our 3D globe view. And uh, I'm going to close that out. And we can fly down and actually appreciate the nature of these very unusual volcanic peaks. And I'm just controlling this with my mouse and standard keyboard game controls here, the WASD, uh, QE. If you've done any computer gaming, you'll be familiar with those. I was not, but uh, even I got the hang of it. But you can see here, we can fly up on these really uh, significant mountain peaks here. And spectrometry from orbit of these peaks shows that they're compositionally different than the typical basaltic lava that we see on the moon. This seems to be more like uh, what we would here on Earth call andesite. It is thicker and pastier. And it has, it had a much higher viscosity. And so as a result, we were able to build up these mountains that have really significant relief. Now, of course, one of the big questions is, why was the lava here so different? And the answer is, we don't know. But that is why these mountains have now been targeted as one of our upcoming landing sites for a robotic mission within the next few years. And so that's one of the fun things that we can do here is we can use the Moontrek platform as a way to explore some of these upcoming landing sites um, and better understand what we're going to be encountering and perhaps learn how to observe some of these interesting features. So another area we're planning to go is Mare Crisium. And you're all familiar with Mare Crisium and we'll fly there now. And a place that we're planning to land is a place that I really was quite frankly very unfamiliar with until recently and we're going to zoom down here and using again the LROC camera we can get a view of a really interesting feature in Mare Crisium. You're hopefully seeing it come into view now. It is a cinder cone that is breached on the south side. So you can see this breach right here. And uh, this has been imaginatively nicknamed Horseshoe Crater. And this is a location that we are planning to again send a robotic mission to within the next couple of years. Now, this is not a big feature at all. Um, we can measure its size and its slope so we can, uh, let's see, I'm going to switch into the global map view. And we can see here, you get, when you're in a global map view, you get the actual uh, distance bar here that you can use to help measure. Or we can, again, of course, pull up our uh, standard tool. So let's use the elevation profile tool to look at this feature we're going to be exploring. You can see it's not very far across. It's about six kilometers across, but uh, we can see that it does have this nice volcanic crater in the center there. Now, I had never before seen a uh, amateur image 
of this feature. It, it's small, it's subtle, and uh, but once I knew we were going here, I tossed this out to uh, the community. And Gary Varney has been uh, doing some successful imaging of this. And as a matter of fact, I ended up showing this uh, image to uh, Firefly uh, Aerospace, that is the commercial lunar payload service provider that is going to be providing the commercial transportation of the payload, the scientific payload, to this location. And they were really quite amazed that amateurs are able to actually image this feature. But, of course, when you look at it through your telescope, it seems significantly smaller than this view from LRO. But you can capture it. And, again, then going to Moontrek, you can help interpret just what it is you are seeing in your images and through your eyepiece. Uh, a location that we're planning to go next year with one of our upcoming lunar missions is to Locus Mortis. So we'll go ahead and fly there. Oops, helps if I press the right button. So we're looking forward to flying here. This will be uh, with Astrobotic is going to be the commercial uh, landing provider. And we can see some pretty fair detail here looking at Locus Mortis. We can see the crater Berg kind of in the middle with this really beautiful landslide that has come down. We can see a number of beautiful fractures uh, straight rills across this floor of Locus Mortis. And these apparently represent areas where magma rose up in dikes through fractures in the lunar crust and wedged the crust apart, causing the land on top of that to drop down in what we would call a graben here on Earth. And so we have a lot of these Graben crisscrossing the floors, but uh, fascinatingly, we have uh, one of these Graben or valleys making a transition to becoming an actual fault. So we can again use the tools here to demonstrate that, uh, calculate an elevation profile. So let's draw a line across this fault here and we can see kind of a valley like but now let's draw another line uh, this time going down here and we can see how now what we have is a step up this is very similar to looking at the straight wall on the moon. So uh, you can really examine some of the fascinating geology going on. And as I mentioned, these fractures seem to be where uh, magma rose up uh, through cracks, and we see good evidence of that. Looking down here toward where this particular rill intersects the wall of Locus Mortis, and we can see two examples of lunar dome volcanoes, each with a little volcanic crater on their summit. I've tossed this out to Gary as another challenge. I've yet to see amateur images of these volcanoes, but he's going for them Question now. already? No, this is something else. <laughs> okay. And so you, uh, you don't have time to do anything. <laughs> but anyways, I'm gonna, night. I'm gonna be leaving shortly oh, to yeah, pick it up. So I'm just giving a heads up. Yeah, actually, yeah. Bill, can you mute please? So uh, 
At any rate, one of the things we'll do is I'm going to show a different view. So we're going to now load, uh, we'll wrap up with uh, flying here. Um, let's do the, uh, Hey Brian, this is Gary. Yeah. Hi, Gary. How are you? Good, good, sir. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to try the uh, the domes again here in the, in the waning phase and see how that works. Since the last few attempts cool. have been uh, seeing has not cooperated. <laughs> so I'm adding another layer here, the Kaguya train camera ortho mosaic. And this is a great layer covering most of the moon's surface. It doesn't cover all of the moon's surface, but uh, especially the poles. But it is kind of a intermediate between the WAC, uh, wide angle camera base map, and the narrow angle camera uh, spotty coverage we were looking at area uh, earlier. And what we'll do here is um, let's jump into the 3D globe view. And uh, what we'll do is Let's go examine that landslide in the crater Berg. And so again, this is uh, taking a look at uh, one of the sites where we're going to be landing, Locus Mortis, and looking at some of the wonderful detail here. And what we'll do is we'll just fly down into the crater berg and look at that landslide along its western rim. I'm sorry for the jerkiness of this across uh, as it appears in uh, Zoom, but when you try this all on your own, it's a very smooth, exciting flight into the terrain of this wonderfully exciting area. And again, this is all interactive, real time. I'm just flying any place I want to go. And uh, one final point I will, uh, let's see, uh, point out that we also have, um, this is all part of what's called the Solar System Trex project. And where we, what we have here, we've been looking at our lunar portal, but as a matter of fact, we have portals for Mars, Mercury, Europa, uh, Titan, our moon, seven of Saturn's smaller icy moons, the asteroids Bennu, Cirrus, Ryugu, mm -hmm. Vesta, Coming soon, Earth and Phobos, and I'm going to blow a secret here right now. I'll also let you know Venus is in the works. So uh, you can explore a number of worlds with this same type of technology. So with that, um, I think what I'll do is just uh, see if there are any questions from the group. So any uh or have I put you all to sleep? <laughs> Definitely didn't put us to sleep. This, this is this is all uh, online stuff. You can't do any of this stuff other than record the videos and stuff. You have to be on the internet. That's right. This is all online. So the, there are many terabytes of data here, and it's essentially layering them in. It's, it's a tiled service so that the as you zoom in, the resolution of what is being sent to you changes. Um, and so this is all, like I say, it's all browser-based. However, um, as I also pointed out before, 
as you bring in data layers, you can download them for use of whatever uh, you want. A lot of these are in GeoTIFF format so that you can uh, uh, bring them into, you know, things such as Photoshop and work with them. Any other questions? Hey, Brian? Yes. It's Gary again. Um, just like you showed this view here in uh, the slump in uh, Berg Crater, can you, do you have a moment to also look at the one that's in Miller? That slump has always caught my eye and, and fascinated Absolutely. me. Absolutely. Let's do that. So what we'll do here is let's do a fly to a Miller. And I'm going to switch to our, looks like this is an area where we've got um, perhaps not the best of coverage with our terrain, the Kaguya. So we'll switch here to uh, going with our LROC base map. And I assume, Gary, is this the area you're referring to here on the yeah. south of Miller? And I, my understanding is that that landslide, that slump, was caused by the crater that's just to the south there, like 637 right. o'clock-ish. Was that, uh, yep. I don't know if I pronounced so it. Uh, yeah, so let's uh, go ahead and change our view so that we can actually fly over that. So Miller is older and then that other impact came in and that caused that landslide which extends inward almost to the central peak. Yep. So let's go ahead and drop down and fly over it and take a look. the right angles of lighting to uh, when you image this crater that that really stands mm. out. So going from the newer crater over to their common rim and looking at the landslide and as you say it went all the way down to the central peak there of Miller. Amazing amount of energy to do that. Indeed. And so again, if you wanted to actually uh, uh, measure the topography of that, um, you can look right down. And so here's that landslide. Let's uh, uh, that's not right. Let's see. We can do an elevation profile and. We can go across the central peak there and so there's the rim. You can see some of this really built up there. Interesting, look at this. This this area right here, the landslide, is actually standing up higher than that edge of the rim between the two craters. I did not realize that. So that, and then we drop down here, hit the central peak, and you can see uh, how this is then climbing back to the other rim. So again, it's a way of helping you interpret the things that you observe in image. Uh, I hope this will be a valuable tool for you. Any other questions? I have a question for the group here. Is anyone uh, 
tempted to go and try and image some of these uh, objects that uh, Brian has pointed out? Sure. Oh, I know you're going to do it. <laughs> <laughs> this might be uh, worthy of sparking some sort of a group effort or, you know, throwing something out in the group. So, all right. Oh, that, that's a great point. Uh, I'm going to show one more thing. Another area that has been announced that we're going to is Rainer Gamma. And you're all familiar with Rainer Gamma. This is a good imaging target. And, uh, but we talked about the upcoming Viper mission to uh, the South Pole. And that rover is going, again, it's targeted for November of 23. And one of the things that the mission team would very much like is during the course of the Viper mission to have amateur astronomers here on Earth imaging the changing lighting conditions on the surface of the moon as seen here from Earth. So uh, again, the lighting conditions at the lunar south pole are very extreme and gaining as good an understanding of them as we can so that could be in advance of the mission and during the mission uh the imagery the high resolution imagery that amateurs can obtain will be of great interest to members of the viper mission team so i would encourage you to uh, to be imaging some of these sites. Brian, would there be um, some sort of uh, a portal or, or maybe a, a repository where images could go to support that mission, <laughs> such as what's done, you know, with the Juno mission at Jupiter? And yes, a, that's what so I would like to see. That's a, where you are in the early stages of discussing that, but I would like to see a uh, portal for uh, those images. We've discussed that, you know, basically we did something similar uh, back for LCROSS, the Lunar Crater Observation Sensing Satellite that impacted in the crater Cabeus near the south pole of the moon. Mm -hmm. And we had a lot of amateur imaging of that. And we established a, uh, a site for upload, but that ended up being uh, an a site that was moderated by the amateur community, working with scientists on the mission team. But we found that this, uh, you know, having it essentially run by the community that is gathering the data with just input from the NASA mission seems to be a really good model. And so that's something I'm advocating that we do again here with Viper. That's right. You did some uh, some some work uh, in relation to that. Was there was there ever a plume detected from the impact on that? I'm trying to think back. So we uh, <laughs> that was uh, one of the interesting things. So we had a big amateur observation campaign to observe the flash and plume of. Uh, the impact of the Centaur upper stage of our Atlas V moon rocket. And from here on Earth, we saw nothing. And actually from the LCROSS spacecraft, as it was coming down, looking at the surface of the moon and looking for that big impact flash of the Centaur hitting the ground, we didn't see it either. And at first, the reaction was, oh, my God, it's a dud. Um, but from the telemetry, we knew that we had hit. Mm -hmm. And um, at first, there was all kinds of uh, derogatory comments about, you know, <laughs> what, a, what a complete dud. And then one of the uh, participants in the amateur campaign, a Dr. Ken Lum, all of a sudden in the chat said, you know something? a negative result is actually pretty fascinating. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, the whole tone of the conversation changed is how do you take a two-ton rocket booster moving at 5,600 miles an hour, 
slam it into the surface of the moon and not see anything happen. And the um, conclusion is that the area we hit was essentially fluffy. Um, it had significant ice content. And so instead of being hard rock, if we had hit hard rock, we would have seen that thermal flash. Mm -hmm. But instead, when the Elcross impactor hit the ground, it burrowed down into the ground and eventually released all that kinetic energy as heat, but beneath the surface. And so, yes, finally a plume was generated that came up, but it was very subtle compared to that flash of what you would expect mm -hmm. by hitting solid rock. But this plume of water vapor did in fact rise into the sky and the Elcross shepherding spacecraft did fly through it, sample it. And that is in fact how we uh, conclusively discovered water ice at the South Pole of the Moon. Very cool. It's like throwing a big rock into a snowbank as opposed to more rocks or more hard terrain. Exactly, exactly. That's really cool. So that's a general overview of the Moon Trek portal. I encourage you all to go to trek.nasa.gov. That's T R E K.nasa.gov and uh, explore the Moon Trek portal. And while you're at it, take a look at some of the others. I know some of you uh, enjoy imaging planets such as Mars, and our Mars Trek portal can be uh, valuable for you. And again, in terms the features that you succeed in imaging uh, in a very similar way to what we've done here today with the moon. Hey, so, Karen, is, there, is there anything in any of these, uh, what would be really cool, and I don't know if this exists, I didn't see it in this because I played around with this quite a bit, um, is if there was a, a a place where you could click on and say what are the what are the active instruments that are either orbiting or currently on the, on the surface that are active versus archived you know mission over you know it's no longer being oh I mean, that's a, that's a good question that's an excellent question and uh, no we currently don't have that. Um, it would be, it would be a, that'd be a nice addition. We had something similar at one point on our Mars portal. It is not active now, but it was showing uh, the uh, spacecraft that are currently orbiting Mars uh, and being able to show you their position at this point in time uh, over the surface. Um, but you know, I like that idea of being able to tell what instruments are currently active. That's a great suggestion. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to add that to our list. Excellent. Because, you know, when you look at this stuff, you, you're like, okay, so when was this layer? And, and if you read on it, you'll, you'll see, you can tell right. by reading on it, but, uh, it would be a lot easier if you, if it was just, you know, a high level thing you could click on. So. Yeah, and we're going to be having, of course, a lot more instrumentation on and around the moon in the near future. And so being able to differentiate that, show uh, essentially active missions and active uh, instruments gathering data. I like that a lot. I really like I, that. I have Thank another you. suggestion also. So if you, Good. how about if you had a layer that, I, that was basically – um, areas of interest that you want the astronomy, uh, the amateur uh, community to focus on and image. So, like, you could just put that on there, and then they would be highlighted somehow. Target images. <laughs> Very good. Okay. Two great suggestions tonight. Thank you. I like both of those a lot. Both from Roy, too. Go figure. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, 
I, I attribute some of that to the fact that Roy is drinking beer during this uh, presentation. So absolutely, beer, beer saved humanity. <laughs> cool, great ideas. All right. Well, I see it's six fifteen. I've uh, kept you probably a little overly long, but I want to thank you all for joining tonight. This is great. If you have any further questions, uh, you know how to find me. I'm there in the Amateur Astronomy Selenology Group. I have been uh, uh, absorbed into your community, and I'm a huge fan of the work that you're doing. Thank you very much, Brian, uh, for doing this. Uh, yeah, we're, we're honored to have you in our group. And, uh, and uh, you know, for those listening, Brian's also one of us. He's also an amateur astronomer, too. So don't be intimidated, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> please, please don't. Yes. Thank you all very much. This has been yep. a real pleasure. Thanks. Yep. I'll pair up. Gary said, thanks so much. Excellent presentation. I've seen this, I don't know how many times now, it was like seven, seven or eight times maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but I always learn new things. You're always bringing new things to the table every time you present it. You're honing it more. So I really, really enjoy it. Appreciate it. Thank you well, so much. So it took you seeing this seven times to come up with two suggestions. That, that's a pretty good batting average. <laughs> <laughs> well, you got to play with it, actually. <laughs> I'm I played kidding. quite a bit with the layers, um, turn them on and off and looking for different things. So the uh, transparency thing is really cool. I'll probably play with that some more. <laughs>